it's not my job to convict somebody else of what that truth is. It's my job to speak to what Jesus has told me is the truth about any situation. I am not the Holy Spirit in someone else's life. And so there's a lot of freedom when you realize that God is God and the Holy Spirit is the convictor and that we are just sinners that make mistakes and don't have the whole picture and Jesus does. So that takes off some of that does that need to cling to an identity of saying, I'm this person, or I stand for this, or I stand against this, because you realize that really, I'm just a Jesus follower. And, you know, we only see in part, one day we'll see in full. And I don't have the whole story, but based on what I see, this is what I believe in. And if Jesus tells me otherwise, then I'll change my mind. Hello, and welcome to the Shifting Culture podcast, in which we have conversations about the culture we create and the impact we can make. We long to see the body of Christ look like Jesus. I'm your host, Joshua Johnson. Go to ShiftingCulturePodcast.com to interact and donate. And don't forget to hit the follow button on your favorite podcast app to be notified when new episodes come out each week. And go leave a rating and review. It's easy. It only takes a second, and it helps us find new listeners to the show. Just go to the show page on the app that you're using right now and hit five stars. Thank you so much. Previous guests on the show have included Caitlin Chess, Justin Bailey, and Jessica Hooten Wilson. You can go back, listen to those episodes and more. But today's guest is Denise Gitsum. Prior to starting her own public affairs consulting firm, Denise Grace Gitsum worked at the highest levels of federal government from the White House to the U.S. Senate, in law firms for startups, and as a candidate for Congress. Denise is a graduate of the Georgetown University Law Center and Bowdoin College, and is a political contributor and commentator on various national cable news networks. Denise and I talk about her latest book, Politics for People Who Hate Politics, How to Engage Without Losing Your Friends or Selling Your Soul. We talk about being ambassadors of the kingdom of God, discernment of the Holy Spirit, unity, not uniformity among believers, loving your enemy, engaging in dialogue, asking questions, having empathy. It's an important conversation as we in the U.S. are about to embark on a contentious political season. So join us as we engage in dialogue with love, empowered by the Holy Spirit. Here's my conversation with Denise Gitsum. Denise, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for joining me. I'm really excited to have you on. Thank you so much, Joshua. I'm honored to be on. You know, you just uh, wrote a book, Politics for People Who Hate Politics. I think it's a great title because I hate politics at the moment, Um, but I know it's important. (laughs) I, you know, I got my master's in social and civic entrepreneurship, so I know that our civic engagement is really important in what we do, but things have been so polarized and nasty lately that it's really not much fun. Um, Why did you say and think now is the time we need a book like this um, and we need to call people to a better way in politics? Well, it's funny. I actually thought we needed this a long time ago (laughs) and the Lord had put this book on my heart for years, but I was loath to actually write it because I too was burnt out of politics. In 2016, I ran for Congress in California's 52nd Congressional District, which is San Diego and the most beautiful parts of the county. Um, and I lost and it was, it was really shattering for me what I went through. And it wasn't just the the pain that I felt from being attacked or just being engaged, you know, in a public way. Um, it was just, I was exhausted about the way, what I saw, especially within the church about how Christians were treating politics like a blood sport. Um, I, I, I thought that I would be the most supported by the church. And in many cases I was. I mean, I'm a board member on one of the largest churches in America and a very influential church in San Diego called The Rock. And so I felt like my bona fides were pretty solid. But even so, Christians were um, some of the most challenging to engage in when it came to the political sphere. Something would switch, like the people that I knew that were loving and kind and generous and and spoke about being that way suddenly had this real, I had a sense that there was a real political spirit that had really infiltrated the church 
And if you remember 2016, it was a pretty contentious presidential race. And so everything was heightened. Um, so I felt like I should write it. And then I kind of just sat back and I said, God, I just don't really want to talk about it because I don't think anyone wants to hear it. Um, when I actually pitched my proposal, my agent uh, sent out my proposal, almost every publisher said, you need to pick a side. You need to be more Candace Owens and less like Jesus, basically. <laughs> and I remember thinking, I, I like the Lord has given me insider experience over, you know, 24 years of working in politics, starting at the White House and in presidential politics to running my own campaign and candidacy. And I've I'm friends with some of the most powerful leaders in Washington. They're people that I grew up with professionally. And um, I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly. And the Lord is calling me to call the church into something different in regards to how we engage. So then, you know, I think I remember in 2020, uh, there a lot of churches started to see people leave because of politics. Um, and yeah. there's a lot of church splits or people saying, I'm going to go find another church that aligns more politically with me uh, instead of really working to focus on Jesus, the kingdom of God, let's focus on, on unity. And we could talk about uh, different sides that we have or different ideas that can implement the hu human flourishing and the goodness of the community in our community. Um, and we could actually have some healthy conversation about that. But people didn't want that. They said, I want to be in one camp or the other. How? Yeah. Why do you think that people started to become uh, so entrenched in different camps within the church? I think that people started to see government as an existential threat to their way of life. So it's really understandable. Like I find in this book that I wrote, Politics for People Who Hate Politics, the subtitle is How to Engage Without Losing Your Friends or Selling Your Soul. Um I think it's important to mention that because we we can't sell our soul. We cannot sacrifice truth. There is no such thing as truth apart from love. And there's no such thing as love apart from truth. And so it's I am a total partisan, to be clear. I am a lifelong Republican. More so, I'm a conservative because I believe in limited federal government. And I am very principled in my beliefs, and I never waver from them. Um, I I'm 100% pro-life. I am consistent on some of the issues that matter the most to me. I never, ever waver. However, I feel as though um, when we become entrenched in our camps and we're so convinced that we are right, we no longer consult the Holy Spirit. It's it's like anything you would do, like your job. If you go to your job and you're just used to doing it a certain way, how often do you stop and say, Holy Spirit, I really need your help? Um, Jesus says in John 15, 5, apart from me, you can do nothing. But if we're living in our own autopilot and the way things are done and, and we're taking on politics as usual, the way we see culture doing it, and we're just used to engaging and thinking that we're doing it in the name of righteousness or justice, we can really delude ourselves into thinking that we're acting in accordance with biblical principles when really we're just acting in partisan ways. And I believe that partisanship is divisive and unity is so central to the gospel um, and and really, it was Francis Chan's book, Until Unity, that really helped solidify one of the biggest themes in this book, which is Jesus said, when you love each other and you'll know they will know you by your love. And when we allow things like politics to prevent us from looking at our brothers and sisters in Christ, but also every child of God outside of the church as anything is less than what God has called us and what Jesus died on the cross for then we are putting our politics ahead of our highest calling, which is to love one another. No, I remember talking with a bunch of uh, uh, church leaders, and they were they were talking about power dynamics and how a certain group of people have more power than another, and we want to make sure there's some equality, some equity amongst groups so that we don't have all these power dynamic shifts. And they're talking about how if one group then usurps power, there's going to really just subjugate the other group uh, again. And there's going to be this cycle of, of power and oppression that happens over and over again. And the one thing sure. I, I don't think that they were, were talking about, the thing that I brought up, uh, was that uh, we have an identity not just in our different camps. We have a, a new identity, an identity in Christ. And, you know, this is how the early church was known, that 
uh, for the first time in history that there were there were rich and poor. There were people from different ethnicities. Everybody came together and said, we are are one in Christ. There's a, a unity there because our identity is in Christ and not in these secondary identities that we have. The question is, then, how can we form that identity in Christ and what will that do to the church and our politics? I love that you asked that question, because at the root of almost every sort of every sin, I think, is a question of who do we think we are and whose do we think we are? And I think it's so easy to get caught up in the world's way of thinking and to cling to identities that aren't aren't the most important ones. And so um, I have a chapter in the book called Identity Politics. You know, we hear that a lot these days. And I open with a funny story about when I was on the Bush campaign, President George W. Bush, Governor George W. Bush's campaign in 1999, my first political job, my boss, Carl Rove, thought that I was Hispanic. And so I'm actually half Chinese and half white, but I, I do look very, I'm, I'm ethnically ambiguous. Let's put it that way. And I had been interning for free for eight months and um, I was getting tired of working, selling gym memberships at night and working all day and all weekend on the campaign for free. And so he said, hey, we've got this perfect job laid out for you. We're going to have you. And I was so excited. And he said, we're going to have you be the Hispanic coalitions coordinator. <laughs> and I just looked at him. I froze for a second and I said, gracias. And I like just rolled with it. You know, I like know no Spanish beyond that, except for what you can order in a Mexican restaurant. And so I, I threw myself into it wholeheartedly. I'd grown up in the valley in an agricultural area. So a lot of my friends were Hispanic. And so I understood the culture, but I wasn't Hispanic. And it was funny how um, I used that as a metaphor for how I started really becoming Hispanic inside. Like I felt a very Latina. I all every. Everyone I hung out with was Latina on the campaign. I was coordinating, you know, Spanish speaking media over here. And I coordinated 28 states. I set up 28 states of grassroots outreach for, you know, amongst the Hispanic community. And everybody thought I was Hispanic. And I started to think that I was Hispanic. And when we start, you know, talking like a duck, walking like a duck, quacking like a duck, we actually think that we are ducks. And I I just thought it was so funny when we went to the inaugural um ceremony and and went to the gala i brought my parents and all the hispanic friends that i had on the campaign were like who's this chinese woman next to you and you know obviously my cover was blown but it's a funny story but it really speaks to what we end up doing every single day i mean whether we're at work and our identity is or we're at home and we think our identity is as a mother or we think that our identity is as an attorney which is i also am and or a, you know whatever a ceo a teacher whatever your job is that you whatever you take pride in maybe you're a community leader maybe you're a politician nothing trumps our identity in Christ and i think that when we allow anything to take precedence over the the kingdom principles and the kingdom identity that we that Jesus died on the cross to give us we are we are putting um our hope in something other than Jesus we're actually putting our hope in our camps in our identities and what we're capable of doing. And it's so anathema to the gospel. Mm. So how does that affect uh, our politics and engagement in civic, our civic life uh, and the way that we interact with each other in that sphere? When we start thinking about what we believe in or what we ascribe to is who we are, we also ascribe the same beliefs about the world around us. So instead of saying, Instead of thinking, I disagree with this person on this issue, their thinking is wrong. We say, if we believe that that identity of that belief system is who they are, we start looking at them and saying, you are bad. Not your thinking is wrong, but you are bad and I am good, right? You're wrong and I am right. And there's no way to escape when you put that label on somebody, you've categorized them as less than you. It's actually rooted in a real sense of self-righteousness, which is also anathema to what Jesus called us to, which is humility. And so I think that just any sort of internalization of anything other than what Jesus has called us to first and foremost is going to put you at odds with anyone around you that threatens that identity. Yeah, I agree. So how do we start to dismantle other identities um, that everybody is clinging on to and holding on on dear right now. How are we dismantling those so that we could lift up our identity in Christ? 
You know, I struggle with this a lot. Again, this book that I wrote is really a compilation of every, not every, I wish I had enough, I wouldn't have enough volumes to write every mistake that I have made in my career in politics. Um, I still struggle with the identity issue. There's when I get into a groove and I feel like, wow, I'm a businesswoman and I have my own PR firm and I am an attorney and I'm on TV and I do political commentary. People will say, what do you do? And I'll have this quick answer and I'm so proud of it. You know, back when I was a politi- political, you know, staffer, I was like, I'm a Republican. I love being a Republican. These are not bad things, but it also clinging to them. It's really more of a heart issue than how you speak about it. I think, you know, from your heart, though, comes comes out your words, whatever is in your heart comes out and, and how you express yourself and how you identify yourself. And so um, it's more indicative, but it's really a heart posture of where are you putting your hope and what's the most important thing to you? You know, I think that for so many of us, especially as election season is starting to ramp up, things with everything going on with Israel and Hamas and with everything, I mean, everybody has sides that they want to take and there's nothing wrong In fact, you should be standing on the side of truth. And it's not my job to convict somebody else of what that truth is. It's my job to speak to what Jesus has told me is the truth about any situation. I am not the Holy Spirit in someone else's life. And so there's a lot of freedom when you realize that God is God and the Holy Spirit is the convictor and that we are just sinners that make mistakes and don't have the whole picture. And Jesus does. So that takes off some of that does that need to cling to an identity of saying, I'm this person, or I stand for this, or I stand against this, because you realize that really, I'm just a Jesus follower. And, you know, we only see in part one day we'll see in full. And I don't have the whole story, but based on what I see, this is what I believe in. And if Jesus tells me otherwise, then I'll change my mind. So then what is the discernment of the Holy Spirit within politics there? How can the Holy Spirit convict Uh, and illuminate something where you were, say, on one side and say, I believe that this is the the issue that I'm going to stand on. And then the Holy Spirit says, uh, maybe there's a little bit more nuance in here than than you think. Um, What does that look like? How can we engage the Holy Spirit to do that? I love how practical you're getting about this because I really struggled with sort of thinking about, you know, I always think if you just get your mindset right and your heart in the right place, then all these practical steps will just flow out of it. But that's not necessarily true. And my publisher really pushed me to add some real practical steps. One of the things that I actually um, learned from my pastor, and my pastor is Miles McPherson. I don't know if he'd identify as a Democrat, but I identify him as a Democrat and or an independent somewhere in the middle. He's an African-American former uh, NFL charger. He was a San Diego charger back when we still had the chargers in San Diego. And, um, and you know, during 2020, things were really tense because he was talking about Colin, Ka- Colin Kaepernick and kneeling for the flag. And he understood why. And he said, look, this is he was trying to explain to everybody why Colin Kaepernick was standing or kneeling the way that he did. And he was very vocal on Black Lives Matter. And um, and here he is, you know, somebody that is sort of straddling um, opinions on both sides of the aisle. Because, of course, he's also 100% pro-life and all the things that are associated with the right. And one of the things that I learned from him was um, it's really important to humble yourself and try to put yourself in somebody else's shoes, right? So I respect my pastor so much that my immediate reaction to things like Black Lives Matter protests and Colin Kaepernick kneeling for the flag that my father fought in Vietnam to defend and all the things that I believe in for our country, which is you should stand in honor our flag, um, talking to him really helped me understand how he arrived at the beliefs that he did. And they weren't wrong. They were different. There were a different perspective. And anytime, I think anytime Christians um, start, and I say Christians, it's really anybody. These principles in my book, I wrote my book for the church because unity, I believe, we are the only ones that are called and compelled to uni- unity by Jesus. So the mandate is on us. There's really no need for the world to unify. I mean, I hope that they want to, but that's that's like, you know, nice to have. You know, we it's a non-negotiable within the church. And so as I'm clinging, I had some really tense conversations with my pastor and 
I think we almost hung up on each other a couple of different times in 2020. Um, and we had to like calm down and cool our jets. But at the same time, I was I really respect him. So I wanted to understand his opinion. And I wanted my heart, you know, I always pray, Lord, break my heart for the things that break yours, right? Make me love the things that you love. And he loves my pastor. And his heart breaks over the racial inequality that our country has perpetuated and our government has perpetuated. And and that's something that I had to learn to put my own feelings aside and my own experiences aside to embrace and be with my pastor and his pain. And that really changed the way that I started to engage in politics. To see somebody, you know, in their shoes, like to feel, to have empathy and compassion and care is really hard when we're trying to say this is the right thing, the issue. Uh, even with with Israel and Palestine right now, which is very hotly contested, uh, but, you know, what Hamas did was uh, egregious and horrible and, you know, very destructive to Israel. What Israel has done to Gaza is also very destructive and has hurt a lot of women and children and innocent people as well. The war sucks and is horrible. Um, and, you know, on both sides, I lived and worked in the Middle East for many years. And so I have a heart for Palestinians and I I love my Muslim friends. Um, and so I have some empathy and compassion to know that there are a ton of innocent Palestinians on this side that, man, I don't want to see them destroyed. And I don't want to see Israel take, you know, all of their their might, their their war might, and just pound people into oblivion. Um, and I also think that Hamas is evil and it shouldn't be, <laughs> go in and and kill and take hostages and and do all that. There's so much nuance there that it's really hard to say what is the truth in this because there's truth that we're all we have humanity, so we're all human. We're all made in the image of God. Then how do we? So even in a hotly contested, you you talked about Black Lives Matter, talked about Israel and Hamas. These are really difficult um, political engagements, and you know I'm going to have some arguments with some people. Um, but then how do we then engage to see the humanity of everybody uh, in a way that? We could start to hear one another and hear each side and not tune each other out and be so like tight fisted in my own opinion that I can't look up and see others for who they truly are. Well, especially in times like these where everyone is picking a side and I'm not saying again, I am not saying that you shouldn't have a side. Holy Spirit does not want us to to peace out and not engage because we realize that everything, like there's moral equivalency, you know, and everything. That's not true. There's good and there's evil. And the scripture says, woe unto those who call evil good and good evil, right? And so God calls us to take, to stand at justice. You know, he calls us to be his instruments of justice. So there's absolutely nothing wrong with saying in the situation, I can see all of it. And this is what I believe the Holy Spirit is leading me to say as the side that I need to fight for. And if God gives that conviction to somebody, that's something that we really need to respect. You know, like it's not my job to tell you what God has told you, the Holy Spirit has convicted you of. Um, but I think that it requires a constant when we are that convicted. I always say the harder the truth, the greater the love that you need to bring into your conversation. The more convinced you are of your righteousness. I, I always find that the closer I get to Jesus, the more I question like my own my own convictions about things like my goodness not my convictions my goodness like i i'm so you know i feel like the closer i get to the light the more i see the darkness in myself and that self awareness that humility that closeness to jesus i i love his discipline i love his correction i used to hate it because i had pride that i wanted to be right and i was afraid and i wanted to keep up appearances and look like i had it all together and i had all the answers and i was so sure of everything but the closer i got to jesus's heart the more i wanted to be like him and less like who he created me to be um with this facade this human facade um the more i wanted to just follow him with reckless abandon the less it was more of him and less of me was really my prayer and I found that he answered that by saying, then you just follow me step by step. And and in humility, 
um, I would ask him, is this really the right thing for me to be thinking? Is this the right way for me to be presenting what it is that I want? Is this the way that you want me to treat people that I disagree with or speak to them in a way? Is this is this representative of you and my heart? Like you're a missionary. So you understand I was a missionary. We are all missionaries in everything that we do in every cultural sphere of influence. Our job is first to be ambassadors of Christ. We are we are you know, spiritual souls having an earthly experience. And we are citizens of heaven who have been given stewardship over our country and the, the communities that we live in and the world. And so what is our what is our responsibility in that regard? It's always to have our allegiance. Like when you see earthly ambassadors, I lived in Washington, D.C. for a long time in DuPont Circle where all the embassies are. And I would go to all the embassy um, parties because I was really poor when I lived in D.C. working for the government and I wanted their free food and it was really fabulous parties for free. And so um, I I and I worked for an um, the British embassy in Beijing when I lived there and I got to do a lot of time. I spent a lot of time with the ambassador and I would just observe these ambassadors and the embassy staff and they were always there to represent their country. They weren't there as their own beings. They were there to represent the policies and the customs and the cultures of their country and put their best foot forward for their country. There were so many countries that I had never visited or even heard of. And I'd go into their embassy and I would walk away with such a favorable opinion of their country just from meeting the people that represented them. And I think that's that's a really good example of how we should be representing the kingdom of heaven because we are ambassadors of heaven here on earth. And as long as we remember that, we won't get so caught up in trying to defend this earthly identity that's so far secondary to what God has called us to in Christ. So as you've been been wrestling with this, coming in from, you know, the the political worlds and, and you know, working in a, a certain conservative camp, as you've been wrestling with this, what are some kingdom principles and kingdom values as ambassadors of the kingdom that we could start to carry in to our political lives and our conversations about it? I think the most important thing, I always will say this, and I know it's not as practical as, as you want it to be, but I can't start with the practical without starting with the spiritual. And it is really just every day. And this is practical, I guess, because this is something I have to do regardless of whether I'm engaging in politics or in anything else is, Lord, you know, I, I really just want your heart for for your people. Like starting there and saying, God, I, I'm going to be your ambassador today. I, I want to be a better ambassador every day for you, Lord. How can I represent you? Who are you going to put on my path to love? And we will look at people the way we would when we are on a mission. Like we know when you go, I've been a missionary in many countries in my life. And when you go, you don't look around and judge the people and their culture. I mean, after all, you are a visitor in their country and in their culture, and you're there to bring the love of Christ. You don't go and say, you need to be like me. You go in and say, how can I meet you where you are so that God can show up for you in a way that is relevant to you? That is missionary 101, right? And I think that that should be just because we live in America and this is our country and you know, our neighbor might be a Democrat or Republican that we disagree or independent or Green Party or whatever, doesn't mean that we're our mission is any different. Our job is to meet people where they are and to show up with the love of Christ, which is what changes them, not our brilliant arguing, right? I, I mean, I've seen how many people did Jesus win over by arguing with them? If anything, it hardened their hearts, right? The Pharisees were like, oh, well, you're smarter than me, so I hate you. So <laughs> let's kill you, you know? And so that didn't really work for anyone. And um, and so I just, Jesus knew better. He wouldn't even answer their questions most of the time. He's not going to waste his space, his time, his energy and attention on people that didn't want to come along, but he did show them love and met them where they were and gave them an opportunity to respond. And so practically speaking, I think the most important thing is just to get back to your question is we've got to ask the Lord to give us the heart for the people that he's called us to meet on our paths, our, our just everyday lives. And if that's in the political arena, um, God's going to equip you with the grace that you need if he's called you there to address those really difficult issues. And I literally, I'm on TV all the time. I'm, I'm a political commentator. I am a Republican political commentator. So I stand for conservative principles on TV and on a national cable news network. And I always have a Democratic 
colleague at least one. Sometimes I'm surrounded on both sides by Democrats, <laughs> and that makes it really fun. And as a lawyer, I love to win. I am like I'm um, I like to go for the guttural. Like I am I'm a good lawyer, and I'm very effective. Um, I'm very persuasive. <laughs> Let's put it that way. And sometimes I find myself getting really hot. I have to ask myself. Lord, like, can you just take over my mouth? Because even if I win this argument, I could lose this relationship, right? Like, and it's not my job to convince them with wise words or persuasive arguments, right? Scripture says, like, we can come in all with all of the earthly giftings of the gift of gab and persuasion, and it still is going to mean nothing. What they're going to remember is how you made them feel and how well you loved them. It doesn't mean you mince words. You still stand for what you want. But people know when you love them and when you're standing for something in in your true convictions that has nothing to do with calling them bad people. And so asking God for the ability to just speak through you is something that I have to do on a regular basis every time I get on TV, especially when it's a really hot button issue that I feel passionately about, I have to check myself 10 times more, if not 100, to make sure that I'm my heart is aligned with Jesus as I go into a conversation like that. Uh, we just had J.R. Woodward on the, the podcast, and one of the things that he, he talks about is how the powers and principalities affect uh, the way that we are and affect our leadership. Um, and he's he talked about we are people of imitation, so we're going to imitate uh, someone or something. So we might as well imitate Christ or we're going to be caught up and imitate uh, the devil and it's not going to work out very well for us. So in that, knowing that we are people that imitate, we're imitators of others. And so in our political world, now we're looking up to our politicians to say, how do we act and how do we engage? Yeah. And we're going to start to imitate. Um, and so how is the like even in what what you're doing with political commentary it's set up for an argument like this is all and we're they want do. it and they want it yeah right? it's for ratings yes yeah. it's for ratings we want the the argument and it makes for compelling tv and people want to yeah. watch it but as an everyday person watching that that's what i'm going to imitate when i go into my conversations with other people and the right. same thing with my Republican uh, yeah, representative that's in Congress uh, against my the Democrat representatives that are in Congress. They're going to argue against each other. Then right. how, how do we <laughs> not imitate all of this argumentative approach and actually go into a place and, and ask more questions like Jesus did and start to try and have these engaging conversations and People like the Samaritan woman, who was a total opposite political camp from the Jews and, you know, who Jesus was. But he was able to engage her to say their spirit and the truth. We're going to worship here. He's speaking the truth. Hey, you he called her out saying you're not even married right now. You've had five <laughs> husbands and the one you're living with is not even your husband. And he's calling out her um, unfaithfulness, sin and, and and different things. But he is loving her. How can we how can we do that and not imitate the argumentative approach? So it depends on the context, right? Everything is uh, there's I just believe that there are seasons, times and places for everything. When I'm on TV, I, I am called to be the Republican voice for an issue. And so it's not my job to have an understanding conversation where I'm asking questions instead of making my position known. So in that situation, what Jesus did with the Samaritan woman wouldn't be appropriate for that context because I'm there to do a job and it's to represent my position. Now, how I do it is really much more important than what I say, right? Like it's much more important that, and one thing that all my friends, um, not all my friends, a lot of my friends are just very kind to tune in to um, The Hill on News Nation um, and watch me when I'm on. I'm usually on like a week or two a month. And they give me, I always ask for feedback, especially from believers. And I said, you know, I really struggle on this issue. They threw me sort of a ball from left field. And I was so nervous about it all throughout the whole um, 
the whole hour that I was on TV, I was like, Lord, I need you to speak through me on this issue. It was about the anti-LGBTQ bills that really were sponsored primarily by Republicans and people of faith, our you know, fellow, fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. And um, I remember being so nervous about getting that question. They said, we're going to give this to you to answer. And I was like, Lord, I really need you to help me to speak the truth in love. I cannot, I cannot compromise on either side. So when I'm done with this, I need you to use my mouth to impress on everybody watching how much Jesus loves them. I don't know if I can do that. And then I realized I just couldn't. And so I just said, Lord, you're just going to have to say, and I, whenever the Holy Spirit speaks through me, I don't even know what I say. And then I got off and I was like, oh, I hope I didn't just blow it, you know? And what I realized was when I was finished talking, um, the Democrat that was to my right said he got, he was teary. And he said, you know, my daughter is actually gay. And the way that you spoke about it, you didn't say that you agreed with them. You just said the way that you spoke about the issue made me feel like she could be safe if people like you were in charge. And I thought, praise God, because I have no idea what I just said. When I went back and watched it, I was like, you did a good one there, God. Um, and it was it was that instead of wanting to go in with an agenda of saying, I've got to stand up for God. We think that we can do so many things for God when really God wants us to show up and be his love to people, right? And he can work right through us when we're willing to lay down all of our earthly ways of doing things and ask him to take over and just use us as his instruments of love. How can we not imitate the argumentative approach? And I think that's yeah. one of the ways to, to do that, to you know talk with conviction, uh, like we have yeah. conviction, but compassion at the same time. Um, yeah. And yeah, we just we just had Mark Yarhouse on talking about how do we we talk about gender identity and sexual politics and in a way where it is convicted civility says convicted civility seasoned with compassion um, and yeah. like, hey, this is who we are um, and don't shy away from that. And what the, what the Bible says, or you know what you believe that Jesus is is trying to speak, but actually season it with compassion um, and civility, like we are actually being able to speak the truth in love. And so that was a great example that you gave there. So, and it's I would just add this um, two things. First, and just in response to what you just said, um, it's really easy to be compassionate when you have an opponent, somebody who disagrees with you, who's also compassionate and civil. In most cases, we are not given um, that blessing, <laughs> certainly not in Washington, certainly not in the middle of election seasons. Um, and so the question becomes, what is our intention when we engage? Um, if we put what Jesus values most first, which is to show up in love and truth, then we're going to ask God for his heart to see the people that we disagree with through his lens. And that's going to change our goal. So we don't have to just kind of like I do often is like when I get hot, I got to like white knuckle it. And, and I'm just like, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? But it's really hard because I don't like the person that I'm talking to at all. And I think they're idiots, right? Like I'm actually very, very judgmental inside because I'm human. And so I'm like, I can't even talk to this human. This is like so asinine that I cannot actually address this issue. And why is this being asked? Those are the thoughts that go through my head because I'm sinful. And and the Lord, I think, I, to, I literally have to slow down and say, God, I want to punch this person like their logic. And sometimes I physically feel like being violent because I'm like, how? I want to shake you and say, how can you think this way? You're being so destructive to so many people. But then I see, A, what you started with earlier, which is that we're not fighting against flesh and blood, but principalities, right? These people are still people that Jesus loves and died for. And so they have to mean more to me than what they're presenting. And also, it's really not them. It's a spirit. And actually, that spirit has has actually affected me as well. They're probably looking at me possibly saying the same thing if they're believers on the other side of the aisle saying, Lord, help me to not punch her out. Help me to recognize that this is a spirit because the spirit of division, Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And he comes for us, the body of Christ. 
He loves to divide. And so that is a spiritual issue that we cannot address through earthly means. And so that's that's one thing. The second thing I would just want to say is where we do have the luxury of time and intentionality when we're not on TV having to give a quick answer in the middle of a debate or, you know, city council meeting and you're standing up and talking about something. Um, Jesus, when he went to see the Samaritan woman, it really wasn't on his path of where he was going. He went out of his way to go through Samaria to meet her for the specific purpose of her going and sharing, you know, who he was with the whole village and to show his love, like that he transcended culture and gender to love people and meet them where they were. Right. It was so outrageous that he had done what he did with the woman at the well, but it was also out of his way. And he he basically like put aside his agenda of what he needed to do and what the disciples probably wanted him to do. And he said, no, I'm going to go be intentional about going and sitting with this person that society has castigated. And I'm going to go and show her what love is. And we it's I'm telling you, I struggle with this. I don't really want to go and hang out with people that tell me I'm wrong or think I'm evil, right? It's just not that fun. I have plenty of great friends. Why would I want to waste my time being arguing, right? But how are we going to bridge the divide if we don't have real relationships with people based on our real lives, not just what we believe about one issue or another, but like how about how they love their family and what can you learn from them? And maybe they have great cooking skills or, you know, maybe you want to go and share a meal. I don't know. But if we're not trying to connect with people on anything other than do you agree with me and there's this litmus test of whether you can be my friend, and if that's all you talk about is politics, you need to get your head checked because that's sick. You know, like Jesus is way more important than politics and loving them well is so much more important than anything that you could ever do in life. And so we have to be intentional the way Jesus was about meeting people where they are even when it's inconvenient for us, when the Holy Spirit tells us to. So one of the questions I have then is that how can we engage locally uh, in our our civic life um, and for the issues that actually matter to us in our neighborhoods or communities or cities um, and not just argue about worldwide politics and things that really we don't have much control over. All we're trying to do is get on a soapbox and, and shout and try to shout louder than somebody else. So what does it look like for us to engage faithfully as Jesus followers in our local communities and to civic life? Well, first we have to be convinced that engagement matters. I think the biggest hurdle for Christians, Christians are the largest, single largest voting bloc in America. When you look across the spectrum on Protestants, you know, Catholics, and I think they throw Mormons in, like the whole mix of faith-based people who kind of share the same goals that are Judeo-Christian based, they we really could change the way politics are done at the national level because we have the loudest and most strongest voice. And we all say that we believe in the same Bible and the same God, right? There's really no other unifying force that people tend to gather around other than scripture and nothing influences us more as people of faith. And so I think we have to understand that because, and I understand this maybe more than most as a daughter of immigrants, is it's a blessing that we get to engage civically in our country's affairs. We get the country that we vote for. And um, it's a matter of stewardship for me. Uh, That's the way that I see it, is that when I was in China and I was detained by the PLA for being a a missionary, and when my mom ran from communist you know, the communist leaders from Mao and his army to flee to Taiwan because they were on the other side. They were on the democracy side. They didn't have a say. Even when they were in Taiwan, they didn't have a say. It was like martial law. Like they didn't have a democratic republic, some something that they could actually engage in a democratic process for. And so we really need, as Christians, the most important thing is because so much of so many of us don't vote at all. That's actually the shocking thing about Christians is that we don't vote. We have loud voices, but we don't. We have opinions and we're upset and we're victimized, but we don't vote. And we can, and we can change things at the local level and at the federal level. And frankly, because Washington, D.C. is the most powerful city in the world, what we do um, has international ramifications global. So I think we need to change the way that we think about 
what we're capable of doing because through us, God can do anything to influence the world. So we need to understand our power um, and, and acting in accordance and being good stewards of the power God has given us to influence. At the local level, I mean, local level is something that I don't know as well because I've spent most of my time in Washington, but I used to serve on a board called the American Council and it's based in Sacramento. And they're really focused. They were very focused. They still are. And they're very effective at school boards, um, getting Christians elected to school boards. Now, I will say this. I have seen many people, many people come to me all the time and ask me for my advice, which I don't really understand because I lost my race. So I'm not sure why they would ask somebody who lost their race how to win their election. But regardless, um, I am always trying to give them some time. And I have so many people that come to me and I say, why do you want to run? And, um, you know, because running is a great thing. I think it's great when Christians get involved. There's a million other ways to be civically involved. You can you can volunteer as a poll worker to make sure that polls, you know, elections are being run fairly and justly. Election integrity is a big issue. So, you know, when you're a poll worker, you have some a lot of say more so than anyone else on how how voting's done. Um, you can you can go volunteer in a campaign. You can go stand outside and wave signs. There's a million ways to get involved, and I list a bunch of them in my book, um, just to get people thinking. Um, but you know, I feel like unless unless we're really understanding of the issues, unless we're actually trying to understand holistically what the issues are and where the greatest needs are, I mean, we kind of have to just be tuned in to what's happening around us, and then we have to be willing to step up. And it's not enough just to be a Christian to run. You actually, like, this is maybe my most frustrated uh, response because so many people say, oh, you should support me because I'm a Christian. Well, that's great. I think it's awesome that you're a Christian. I know a lot of non-Christians that are remarkable government leaders. They don't have the mind of Christ, but they really stand for the right things. You know, if you're like a democratic socialist and you're a Christian, I'm not voting for you. I don't care. Like, it's not happening because I don't think that's best for our country. And I don't care where your personal, private, religious convictions are. I respect you as a brother or sister in Christ, and I pray for you. But I am not going to vote for principles that go against what I believe is best for our country and for our fellow Americans. And so Christians need to get really clear on um, just because somebody tells you that they're a believer doesn't necessarily mean that they're always the most likely to win or the best candidate. And I, I write, a, there's a whole chapter in my book. I've seen so many of the dark sides of politics behind closed doors and the things that political operatives say to manipulate believers. And so I have a, a chapter called, Why, I think they it ended up being Wise as Serpents. You never know what happens when publishers get a hold of your book. But it's called I think it's called Wise as Serpents. And I, I tell a really sad story. Um, it's one of many um, where, you know, a really well-known um, leader that brands himself as a Christian behind closed doors was talking about how he was using the church really for his own organizational um, just finances, for his own finances, to raise his own um, just, you know, influence. And, and he's very active on the church circuit. And I saw him say things and make pledges to people who are in politics in a you know closed door steakhouse room in the back back room where he thought everyone was in violent agreement and it made me sick and I thought believers are jumping over cliffs for this guy because he's saying things to churches about engaging and we need to be wiser we need to ask the Holy Spirit for discernment so that we understand the spirit that's at work within us because even I think character is so important you've got to look at people's character I know this is not a popular thing to say these days, so they're like, just look at, and, and I kind of, you know, I said, you know, you could have, you could have great character and totally the wrong principles and I'm not going to vote for you, but where you have options amongst candidates and you look at their life, are they using up Christians? Are they actually living? I mean, I'm not saying that you have to be a priest or a pastor or you have to live a spotless life. Nobody would qualify, but don't you think that when we have an option to support somebody who has the character that supports their convictions, that we should not be defending character flaws that people flaunt so flagrantly and just expect Christian? I mean, I just think of like, if people are judging me, my life is to be a witness for Christ. And I say that I believe in a certain set of principles that are 
in scripture. But then I go and I throw all my support behind somebody who lives in, you know, total opposite way or stands for things or speaks in a way that's totally the opposite of everything that I say I believe in without calling out that part of, of you know, you can say I disagree with the way this person lives or the way this person is, but I believe in these things and this is why I'm voting for this person. I just think Christians aren't nuanced enough when they go up and they, they're willing to sacrifice their witness at the altar of a candidate that is totally misaligned with the gospel. I, it breaks my heart. Because the world looks and they see the hypocrisy in it. Mm. So I know that we're, I mean, we are all susceptible uh, to giving in to temptation from the enemy um, that we want to, yeah, we want to build our own kingdom by our own power for our own glory. Um, and that's what we're tempted in. I think that's the, the biggest thing that we're tempted. But, you know, it's it's God's kingdom. Uh, it's by his power and it's for his glory. Um, and so you you talked about, OK, there's there's things that are happening in closed doors. How can we not give in to those temptations um, and think like, oh, I'm, I'm, you know, principled based. I'm just going to move this this direction. But you're really giving into temptation and you're not really aware of it. I, I think the self-awareness isn't always there for us. So what is how do we do that? <laughs> I think I think a lot of people. Um, are asking the question, how can I have discernment from the Holy Spirit? What is the role of the Holy Spirit and how can I engage Holy Spirit in all of these things and be aware of what is going on in the spirit world and not just in like what I see with my eyes? Well, I'm kind of new to the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I started, uh, I always heard of the Holy Spirit in the Trinity. Um, I grew up, I love my Baptist roots. I know the word, you know, inside out and backwards, I feel like because I was so rooted in it and so well versed in it as a child and growing up in the Baptist church was such a blessing. Um, but one thing we didn't do much in my specific denomination was um, we didn't really talk about the Holy Spirit very much. So I didn't really understand the book of Acts. And I thought, well, that was for a, a different season, a different time. And I, I have since the Holy Spirit has shown me very clearly that prophecy and all the spiritual gifts are out there for us and um, for us to have. We have supernatural. We have supernatural gifting at our fingertips, um, including my favorite, which I think the Lord has really helped increase as I've gotten to know the Holy Spirit better and develop an intimacy and understanding of who the Holy Spirit is in my life. Um, discernment is probably my top spiritual gifts. I don't have all the flashy ones. I'm not a great prophet. Um, I am somewhat prophetic, but I'm not uh, like I would never claim that for myself. That's what other people will say. Um, and their definition is obviously very broad in order to encompass me. Maybe they were just trying to make me feel better. Um, there's a lot of really cool gifts out there that I wish that I had. And I keep asking the Lord for them. But the number one thing that I'm grateful for is the, the gift of discernment. And even that can be um, just swept to the wayside when I decide that I want something and then I reverse engineer all my thinking to align with what my heart wants, right? Which is not hardly ever naturally aligned with what the Holy Spirit wants because of my sinful nature. And so um, I just, I think that asking any believer just needs to know, and this is better answered by people who really have been steeped in an understanding of the Holy Spirit for a lot longer than me. Since about 2017, I have been studying the Holy Spirit and I'm still learning. But what I have learned is that when I ask the Holy Spirit to change my heart, to speak through me, to use me, to just literally um, draw me closer into the, because the Holy Spirit is such a comforter, right? It's the Holy Spirit is like very maternal in the way that I see the Holy Spirit. And, um, and when I don't have peace in something, I usually think that's because I'm depending on myself instead of the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is peace. And so think about that in terms of politics. How often are you peaceful when you're engaged in politics? Probably never, because there's that's a reason that we're not allowed to talk about politics at the Thanksgiving, you know, at Thanksgiving dinner and at work. Um, and so asking the Lord, asking the Holy Spirit to partner with me and my heart and in my words and to really 
surrender to the Holy Spirit, everything that I do and I say before I engage in politics is so important and and it's so critical. And I wish I'd known this a long time before 2017. I wish that I had known that that was something that I could access so readily and that God wanted me to have so much. It was such a, it's such a gift because when I realize I'm at the end of my own capabilities, which is silly because I never have any capabilities apart from him, um, from Christ, I, I am able to sit back and say, you know, Holy Spirit, just do what you need to do through me and shape my heart. And it's such a relief. It is instantaneous peace and it's instantaneous power. That's the other thing is we don't serve like a passive God who just is like, you know, say la vie, whatever, you know, happens, happens. He's powerful. Holy Spirit is so much more powerful than anything we could ever do in our own right or our own strength. And so I always want to have a supernatural advantage when I'm engaging in the world. As Chris Ballatin at Bethel Church says, we're solutionaries. We're like the Holy Spirit equips us with solutions for real world problems. And Christians are the ones that are empowered and have access to that Holy Spirit insight to solve problems that nobody else can. That's how I feel about my book. When I went to all the publishers, um, I got turned down by everyone. I told you they wanted me to take this position, like stand for something. And I said, yeah, I'm standing for Jesus. I'm standing for what I think he wants us to show up as, as believers in the political sphere. I'm not standing for a set of principles. We have political parties to do that. I'm standing up for the character of the church as we engage in culture in one of the most divisive areas of culture. And so um, how... You know, that is something that the Holy Spirit gave me to say. It's not something that I was clever enough to come up with. And so that's a solutionary perspective is how do we do things not the way the world does it, but in a way that God would want us to do. And it always looks different. And that's why Jesus was such a revolutionary. Mm, That's beautiful. Well said. I love that. That's awesome. Um, As a side note, uh, a long time ago, my somebody told my wife on her birthday that she is a solutionarist, like, and I think they made up that word solutionarist, but that, that is one of her Amazing. core identities now. She's like, I am a solutionist. That's so good. <laughs> yeah. yeah I, I wish it was more core to me. I think I still try to figure out way too much on my own. And then I'm like, oh, wait, I have access. It's still like a muscle that I'm learning to grow. So maybe your wife has some good tips for me on how to stay there. Yeah. I wish she had some good <laughs> tips for me too. Um, (laughs) (laughs) I bet she does. Maybe you should ask her. (laughs) Maybe I should ask her. And yeah, she wouldn't hesitate to give them to me. So that's good. (laughs) You don't have to ask her. I get it. (laughs) Um, What would you like to say to people, your readers or anybody listening to this conversation? What's like the the major thing that you want them to, to understand and get and grab a hold of? The thing that I think all believers would say, but maybe their feelings don't always align with this. It's like the right church thing to say, but isn't really how even I engage all the time or even 50% of the time. And I wish that I did. And I'm asking the Lord for more. So I don't have to put all these caveats before before I say it in the future is, you know, um, who knowing who you are in Christ is going to shape everything you do in every sphere of cultural influence. This book is written about my personal experiences and mistakes and what Jesus taught me and corrected me in. Thankful, so thankful for his discipline and correction. That's really what this book is. It's like a personal mea culpa and how God is teaching me to do politics better. But it's really just a book about discipleship. And discipleship starts, begins and ends with who we are in Christ. And so if we are followers of Jesus, then we have died to our old self and we put on a new self and we're constantly trying to figure out how to fit in that new suit because it's now at the matter who we are in the flesh. And so if when I'm talking on this podcast and your listeners are listening and there's something that I'm saying that makes you angry or makes you think that woman is stupid or she doesn't get this situation or she doesn't understand the gravity, just remember that I worked in the White House on 9-11. I actually helped our nation develop an entire national framework of national security laws. And I have been on the front lines. I have been targeted. I have been screamed at. I have been called horrible names, even by believers, um, all in the name of righteousness and truth. And I have been on the front lines and I've been behind the scenes and I've seen so much of it. And so if you think this is coming from a, you know, a Pollyanna perspective of, 
she's just not she doesn't understand what's at stake nothing could be further from the truth but that might be your greatest indication that there's a part of your heart that the holy spirit needs to work through to understand how the religious spirit has infected you because that's what that was the reality that i had to deal with was like jesus warned about two types of leaven i i joke about it i'm like we need to cut the carbs as a church there's a leaven of heresy of herod and the leaven of the pharisee that's the religious and the political spirit think about what happens in a church in an election style cycle it's the confluence of the two spirits that come to head so powerfully that all it results in is a sense of self-righteousness and indignation and anger and division. So my question and challenge to everyone listening, including myself, is who are we going to follow in this next election cycle? It's not going to get less contentious. Are you going to step aside and say, I hate politics? Yeah. Well, that's why I wrote this book for you. Um, you need to engage because you've been given an opportunity to, and you need to be a good steward of what God has given you. But how are you going to engage is really the question because Jesus cares as much about our character, if not more than what it is that we stand for. Hmm. That's so good. Uh, I have a couple quick questions. Uh, one, if you could go back to your 21 year old self, what advice would you give? <laughs> uh Maybe try to live like a Christian and ask the Lord to actually change your heart instead of just wearing the mantle and the crown and the sash and um, telling everyone else that they're wrong. <laughs> I mean, I was raised I was raised in a very legalistic sort of environment. And so appearances were everything. And you could hate your neighbor and you would tell him, you know, God bless you. I mean, I was also in Texas for a while. So I got to do like the all day church on a Sunday. And I would go out the night before as a 21 year old and drink and do all kinds of crazy things and clean up just enough to look presentable and pretend that I hadn't done all the things that I had done. So it's, you know, appearances mean nothing to the Lord. And I wish that I'd known that when I was 21, I would have maybe come to deal with the truth of my sinful nature a lot earlier and embrace God's discipline much sooner, sparing myself a lot of pain and embarrassment. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, I think a lot of people would would enter into that and say, yes, this is uh, good yeah. advice for, for anybody. <laughs> I'm glad I'm not alone. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you are not alone in that. You are not alone. How can people connect with you and go out and get your book? Yeah, thanks for asking. So my website is, um, we just kind of threw it together because of this book is Denise Grace Gitsum, G I T S H A M dot com. And you can get my book. Um, right now it's 40% off on my um, publisher's website, Baker Books. You can go to my website and there's like a link there. Oddly, when I go to it myself, just their website, it's not on sale. So um, you can get it on Amazon, you can get it anywhere bookstores um, are carrying it. I'm also on Instagram at D G G I T. S H A M. But I just want to warn you if you don't like golden retrievers, do not follow me. <laughs> <laughs> Who doesn't or like a Warriors. golden retriever? I'm, Come on. I'm like a huge Steph Curry fan. And so the Golden State Warriors and retrievers, it's the first day of basketball season. So there's going to be a lot of posting about how amazing Steph Curry is. <laughs> well, Steph Curry is amazing. He is incredible. And <laughs> I'm glad we agree. <laughs> golden retrievers are maybe the best dogs out there. So, oh. I knew I, we were friends. I knew right. it. You are so a... inspired by the Holy Spirit. I love it. We're so aligned. <laughs> I am. I, as somebody who in high school, they wanted me to play play a post. They wanted me to play, you know, power forward. I would constantly go back out into the three point line and I'd be I'd just shoot Thank you. And, you know, so I was like, that's what I wanted. I just wanted three pointers over and over again. Yeah, you and so, Steph, man. It's like your brothers. That's right. I wish that was the case. That would be amazing. Um, <laughs> Denise, I love this book, Politics for People Who Hate Politics. I think it's really important for people to engage in a way that, that looks like Jesus, that have the character of an ambassador of the kingdom, of what it looks like to be embody Jesus in our political sphere. Um, thank you for bringing in the Sermon of the Holy Spirit. And what that was, I love this conversation. Um, I really enjoyed talking to you. I could talk to you for for hours. It would be fun. Likewise, um, so, I know. <laughs> thank you for this. I really enjoyed it. Uh, hopefully, a lot of people get a lot out of it, and they go out and get your book, Politics for People Who Hate Politics. And it's a great thing to gift 
for this upcoming political season as well. So just go buy boxes of them and then hand them out to your friends. So thank you. Couldn't have said it better. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) Thank you so much. God bless you. Yeah. Bye. Thank you for listening to the show today. If you're really enjoying the show, please don't forget to hit the follow button on your favorite podcast app. You could do it right now. Just hit that little plus. Um, And then I would love it if you would leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts so you could go right now to the show and leave a star rating uh, and review and let us know how you are enjoying the show. And find us on Facebook and Instagram so if you want to connect, interact, Uh, I post a lot of quotes and different things that you could actually interact with the episodes and let me know how you are enjoying the show. If you feel inclined to donate, uh, there is a support the show link in the show notes, um, and it would send you directly to a page where you could donate so that new episodes can be produced for your enjoyment. So thank you so much for listening, uh, and I hope you have an incredible week.